Well, good evening and welcome everyone to uh, this uh, workshop as part of the athlete education programme at the 2021 School Games National Finals, um, where we're going to be focusing on the power of being an athlete. So what we're going to be exploring through the, this session as a group together is what it means to be an athlete as a competitor or as an ambassador, an influencer and an activist. And these things might be things that you've never um, thought of. They might be things that you regularly think of. Uh, I don't know, but we're going to explore them as, as concepts in the context of helping you as young athletes to really think about the kind of support that you might want, think about how you might want to use your voice, think about the people you might want to speak to, and really wanting to make sure that you feel empowered to make the kind of decisions that you want to about your identity as an athlete. So what are we going to do over this next period of time? Well, by the end of this session, we hope that you will have an increased understanding of the influence that athletes can have, what this might look like um, through your shoes and potentially through the shoes of some others who've been there before you and with you, why we think this is important and valuable, and also consider what is right for you. But I'm not going to be doing that alone. I'm going to be working with um, two great colleagues of mine, uh, Simon and Alistair. So I'm just going to hand over to Simon and Alistair just to briefly introduce themselves. But what I'm going to do for you both, could you try to introduce yourselves in the context of what your biog might look like or say about you on Twitter? That's a different kind of challenge of introduction. Uh, Simon, why don't you go first? Okay. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Will, and hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so, you know, in, in 280 characters, um, Simon Rofe, uh, scholar, uh, advocate, sometime coach, um, particularly my, my areas of interest as a university lecturer at the University of London around sport and diplomacy. So as a scholar of diplomacy over a number of years, and with some experience of working for LOCOG in 2012, I saw a sort of coming together of, of the patterns of behaviour and practice within the world of sport, um, alongside the world of diplomacy. And that's something that I've pursued. Um, people have been kind enough to say pioneered as a, an area of research and activity over the course of the last eight, nine, ten years. So that's how I arrive here today, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Simon. Alistair, over to you. Okay, um, I'm the guy with the long name, so <laughs> thank you for having me, everyone, and I hope you enjoy everything that we do. I'm Alistair Patrick Heselton, um, but my friends just call me Alistair. Um, I was an ex-mainstream footballer, played for Queen's Park Rangers, but finished my career as a seven-a-side Paralympic footballer for the people that either are born with cerebral palsy or contract a head injury, as I did. And I think my football career very much reflects myself as a person, where I've always been someone that tends not to give up. I always try to hang on to every chance I've got. And I think um, maybe football is probably the best thing that I could do with the sort of attributes I find important in myself. I'm also someone that likes to try to further themselves like around the things that I'm passionate about. Now, people that do know me well know that I love cars and helping others. So um, I then ended up actually training and getting a racing license. So when I drive, I am qualified to drive on track. I do also teach others on track as well, all the theories of what it takes to drive on a track, as well as being an athlete mentor with the Great Youth Sport Trust. Fabulous. And you're part of our athlete mentor team at the Games this year. Now, uh, my, I, I'm Will Roberts. I'm part of the leadership team at the Youth Sport Trust um, from a Twitter bio kind of point of view. Well, you're going to see actually my bio on uh, shortly when I put a slide up, a um, bit of a reveal on what we're going to be doing next. Um, but in terms of my working career and my, my life in sport, I was pretty good at sport at school. I would not have been amongst you guys as a competitor at school games in my chosen sport. I would have probably been reasonably close, but someone who didn't quite make the cut. And I made a series of decisions through my sporting life to try and um, get myself the satisfaction I wanted. So I'm nearing 40 and still playing regularly because I just love it. Um, but at the age of about 18, I realised I wasn't going to get where I wanted to on the field of play. So I turned to coaching, um, having already decided to swap sports because I thought I'd get better, uh, get further in, a, in my second sport than my first. Then realised that my ambitions couldn't be met there. So I became a coach and then moved into a career in sport and pursued that. But I've kept my playing and my coaching going throughout because I absolutely love it. And I think it's core to who I am. And I guess that's part of the power of being an athlete, right? 
because it goes with you and it means something in terms of your identity. And we're going to explore identity uh, through this session. But Simon reflected some of his expertise previously, and, and Anna's just been there as an athlete. And one of the things we're going to really look at today is what's an athlete as an ambassador? We're all constantly an ambassador for something. Alistair's proudly wearing his Youth Sport Trust top. He's being an ambassador for the Youth Sport Trust right now. And that's absolutely fantastic. I've got these logos on the screen behind me right now. So I'm being an ambassador for the games and for the funders of the games and the partners of the games. Simon's described himself as someone who's anchored into working at the University of London. So there's an ambassadorial role there as well. But playing your sport makes you an ambassador for that game. And in some ways, I guess, coming to school games, national finals and representing Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland or part of England means you're an ambassador for that area. And there's something in terms of meaning to that. And that's what we're, we're going to spend our time exploring. So without any further ado, I'm just going to move us on uh, a little bit. Um, I'm going to ask some questions, how you would describe yourself. So as you're watching um, this session right now, and this goes for you as well, Simon Alistair, we're going to consider these questions too. I'm just going to put up a set of questions for us to start with, uh, if I can get them to come up on the screen. Uh, slight technical issue, there we go. Um, so how would you describe yourself? What comes first? Is it your appearance? Is it where you're from? Is it your interests? How you do at school as an athlete? So. Do you say, hey, you know, I'm Will and I'm approaching 40 and my hair's receding, so it's my appearance? Or is it, hey, I'm Will, I'm from Stoke-on-Trent in the north of England and I'm pretty proud of being from there? Is it, you know, I do pretty well at school or is it as an athlete in your sport? How do you describe yourself? What's important to you about that? Alistair, how would you describe yourself? How would I describe myself? I think... Certainly, I'm um, not with my appearance. I think our appearance almost comes before us, so I'll always do my best to present well anyway, so that's what people will see from the get-go. And I think just it's more how I conduct myself. I hope that people would actually get a real good understanding of who I was without me having to actually go into who I was, um, if that makes any sense. Well, um, but I, I'd always um, say honesty is one thing that you'd get from me and integrity, where... I do try to actually, anything that I ask of someone else, you could rest assured I would be doing it myself. So I don't try and think I'm above, or certainly I won't let myself feel like I'm below anybody else. Okay, and I hope all the athletes watching are not only listening to what you're saying there, Alistair, but also considering these questions. So that was a, that was a great answer. Do you think other people, Alistair, perceive you in the same way that you try to present yourself? Well, do you know what, that word perceive, I think that is um, key to being like, you know, a young role model or any role model or ambassador, because it's the perception that other people have of us. And I often think that through the way I conduct myself, it can be, it can actually be seen as like, you know, everything I then talk about. Yeah, do you know what? That is pretty much who he is without having to actually say it. Fabulous. Okay. So when we did our intros, I, I laid down the, the mini challenge of, what does your Twitter bio say about yourself? So what I'd like us all to do, athletes uh, who are watching this in the Athletes Village during the games, is open up your own Twitter bio. If you're on Twitter, apologies if it's not the right platform for you. Maybe it's your Instagram bio. Might be more appropriate. Um, I've talked about me age enough to refer to me being on the wrong social media platform. But there's mine. Um, and there's Laura Kenny's. You know, I often try to compare myself to great Olympians like, Laura, uh, even if it's only on this level. And you can see straight away, actually, as people, we do try to articulate certain things about ourselves that aren't necessarily what we'd see straight away. So everyone on this conversation knows me because I work in Youth Sport Trust. But there's a lot more to me than that. Everyone knows Laura Kenny because she's an Olympic champion. She's incredible, right? But she says what's most important is the fact that she's mum to Albert. So she's being an ambassador for not only being an Olympian, uh, but she's also using that power of being a, an elite athlete, an Olympian with a completely unrivaled record to say more about herself. Yes, she's referring to the brand that sponsors her, but she's saying that motherhood and parenthood is really, really important as well. So these are really important considerations. So right now, I'm hoping that you've all really considered how you describe yourself 
had a bit of a think about how other people perceive you in relation to that description of yourself, but then also thought, well, what do I actually make as statements to the world? And what am I saying um, that other people can stop and pause and, and listen to? So athlete identities is our next major discussion. So we're going to talk about how the athlete identity can be formed. And to do that, we've got, we're going to run through some different kind of athletes. And Simon and Alistair, please do interrupt me as we go along through these. They'll hopefully put a smile on faces uh, as we go through. So first up, success is not required. Now, this does definitely age me, uh, but hopefully you all know this is Eddie the Eagle Edwards. Uh, having grown up in the Midlands, he was always seemed to be on Midlands today. He must have been a Midlands athlete training in his backyard. But I guess what's really important about him, and Simon, we discussed Eddie beforehand, didn't we, when we met up, was he became so famous, not because he was a great athlete. And if I might, Will, there, and what was interesting about that is he was the only athlete name-checked in the closing ceremony of the 1988 Winter Olympics in Calgary. Um, as an individual, 200 plus gold medals uh, awarded um, and his was the only name. And because he was effectively so bad at his competition, uh, the ski jumping, they changed the rules. So the governance of his sport within the uh, Winter Olympics was changed because it was potentially dangerous for him to be as bad as he was uh, in the sport he did. Now, that took a great deal of courage and and, and an energy on his behalf and you know is made into a, a film with Hugh Jackman which you know is, is worth a, a watch of an evening um, but there were some important implications here for his identity you know he was the in some sense he's the face of the games despite all those gold medals awarded to supreme achievement and he became a, an icon because of that and whether he appeared on the Midlands Today or other um, reality programs of the day um, these were you know an, uh, an impact that as an athlete he had and you know the support he had from uh, the British Olympic Association and others you know we're not necessarily clear about but it's important to recognize the impact he had. Absolutely next some things mean more to you and I guess you know, what we see through the Brownleys was, you know, Alistair Brownlee, his sibling love for his brother uh, meant more to him than crossing the line first in a very memorable race. And of course, uh, Johnny, not to be underestimated, now has the full set. Um, he's completed the Olympics. He's sat on, stood on every element of the podium. Um, but again, in terms of identities of an athlete, you've got a real transformation for both of the Brownlee brothers there in terms of how they might be remembered in the long term as athletes in the same way as we look back now on Eddie Eagle Edwards 30 odd years later. Equally, are you going to be remembered or are athletes remembered for their, their worst moments or for their best? Now, this is Derek Redmond, who was a top, top 400 metre runner, really iconic, actually really stylish runner and part of a great crop of athletes we had at that time in the early 1990s. And now he became a world and European great. He was a champion at continental and global level. But he's perhaps best known for the iconic moment on the left-hand side of the screens there when his uh, Achilles ruptured in the final of the 400 metres at the Barcelona Olympics. And his dad somehow <laughs> overcame all the security. Well, if you look back at the footage, it doesn't look like there was much security. But his dad made it onto the track and helped him over the line. Now, Alistair, you underwent significant change in your career, as you've already started to describe. Um, how, how does it feel as an athlete to think that these moments in your career might define how other people see you? Well, I think it's one thing for how it defines other people see you, but I always found it's how, it, um, how you see yourself. And I know like a couple of prior slides, the one that I'm going to challenge you on, Will, which said success is not required. And I think, well, we go back to what is success. And I don't think there's anything more successful than being able to embrace yourself and want to actually show it to the world and like, you know, have your voice. So um, I think when we talk about medals, if that, are we saying that's like success? Because when I was competing at London 2012, I was kept getting it from all the team around me, which was Alistair. Um, if we're in a gold medal match, 
and a cross comes in. Everyone knows I don't head the ball where I head guard because of the protection I have around my skull. And they said, Alice, if a cross comes in, are you going to head that ball? Like it? And in all honesty, do you know what? I said, I wasn't going to answer it because I'll just have to wait. But deep down, there's a bit of me that I don't think I would have headed the ball because you have to look at um, every doctor that saved my life and everything else. And the, the time that my parents were going through when I was in that coma and everything else. For me, I think there are some things that are more important, certainly, than whether it's a medal that we hold up. And, like, you know, whether I'm holding a medal or not, I'm still going to be me. And it's that person that I think we have to be comfortable with and happy with. So um, it always goes up to those perceptions and things like that. But what do we really care about? Is it someone else's perception of us? Or is it let me be happy with my own perception of myself before I can give it to anyone else, you know? That's a great tee up now for the next uh, three examples we're going to get. It's almost like we scripted this, and honestly, everyone, we, we really, we really didn't. But that's a, it's a, it's a great example, Alistair, of the. There's also the personal challenge that you take on by stepping into being an athlete. Yeah. There's certain decisions then that that kind of need to be made, and you need to know what matters to you, right? Yeah, one hundred percent. Okay, so what is it to be you? So we've got Tom Daly. Um, what it was to be Tom Daly. Well, in the 2008 Olympics, it was the, in Beijing, it was it was one of our youngest ever Olympians. And he was this kid who was changing the sport. But come the Tokyo Games this year, you know, four Olympic Games later, it was about being a gold medalist, about being the guy who had been part of our consciousness at the top level of performance sport throughout. But you know what? Perhaps most memorably, as we look back, could be the statement he made in the Commonwealth Games in 2018, which is where he laid down a challenge to um, nations in the Commonwealth where homosexuality is illegal. And he was able to proudly stand up and say, yeah, this is great, but you know what? In 37 other countries competing at this event, it would be illegal to be me. And he used his platform to really stand up for what it was to be him. And building upon that, Kathy Freeman opened the Sydney 2000 uh, Olympic Games, really notable as an Australian athlete who was proud to be Aborigine, who was proud to have that Aborigine identity, but also really proud to be an Australian, but she was not prepared to have one compromise the other. In a polarised world, right, we always know at the moment, life seems to be built of yes and no. It's either this or it's that. And Kathy Freeman was a great ambassador for saying, you know what, both of those identities are important, but I'll never turn my back on either of them and I will represent the world I want to. And I, I did see in the nomination of Naomi Osaka to light the flame in, in Tokyo at the Olympic Games this year, some memories of the uh, Kathy Freeman um, torchbearer there in, in Sydney. But finally, for this little segment, and I think this, Alistair, I'm going to call you back in on this. And Simon, you might want to weigh in on this one as well. Um, but Alistair, on the back of what you said before about identity and everyone watching really needs to think about this. So this is uh, an image of the one of the Polish swimmers, the six Polish swimmers who were selected and flew and arrived at the Athletes' Village in Tokyo as Olympians to be competing, only to find out they should never have been selected. That an administrative error had gone through and they'd never actually met the qualifying threshold. So they believed they were going to be Olympians, which Alistair, I think you've described sort of the value just of being a Paralympian. Yeah. I've been able to say that I, if nothing else, I've achieved that. Yeah. Robbed of that right. What how do we feel these these six swimmers would have felt when they jumped back on the plane and got back and felt they had to explain things to their family? Yeah, I, you know, it's very interesting because when you think of um, arriving for competition, there's so much around that that you've been building up yourself, all the sort of mental preparation, the self-talk that you go through, and everything else. And it would it would almost be a case of you are right up in the clouds to they'd be knocked down so quickly. And like everything else, it just takes time to adjust. And I do think when they would realign themselves and get that perspective, they, they will overcome it. And we say, okay, if I'm not an Olympian or a Paralympian. Who am I? Well, let's remember that these things are just titles, okay? And even like before I present as a footballer, well, I'm a I'm a man, a person before I'm a foot. It's only that person that can become a footballer, you know. I don't say I'm Alistair a footballer. This is 
like you know who I am football something that the person does and I find that it's always a case of just trying to align yourself correctly because yeah without like your sport who are you and often find well who I am is what put me in the sport because without all the qualities and attributes that I have as this person I don't think I'll be able to do that sport you know so I, I always think the person comes before the sport that you're trying to achieve. Simon from a theoretical perspective building into your kind of base of knowledge where do those where do those swimmers sit what might what might they be feeling well i suppose there's, a, there's an element of um them as, as sort of non-state actors they're sort of in that in-between area between you know the official endorsed qualified swimmers who you know could wear their uh you know their, their caps um you know uh, within the competition but those who've who've left their their country to represent something now they they thought they were representing themselves their country their sport in you know the world's preeminent multi-sport event but actually the challenge that they were unable to because of an administrative error you know that that must the the, the empathy that um i at least feel towards those athletes you know that immediate change of identity um you know and, and it has parallels in other walks of, of life if you know if you end up in a you know a natural disaster zone and and you know, the, 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 you go from, you know, minding your own business to being in a position either of needing assistance or being able to offer assistance, or you know, sometimes your identity can change very quickly, but it can be a shock. And the ramifications for that further down the line, and particularly in terms of performance, you know, and, and you know, the audience we have here, you know, are interested in outputs and the performance of that, then that's going to impact, you know, the, the, one of the things I would say that sport has, and, and Alistair's a, a great example of this, is, is a sort of redemptive opportunity, you know, to change the direction of the narrative, you know, from, um, you know, injury to, you know, overcoming that, that, that triumph um, of, of will and, and perseverance training, you know, is one of the, the reasons we embrace sport and sport has such a strong place in society. Um, for, for everyone not just you know athletes like yourselves so I think there's definitely something there to to hang on to but it's important to to think about the implications of your identity you know if you're if you're solely defined by one thing a switch in that can make a big difference to you can I jump on um what you said there because it was all excellent that when we look at them as athletes okay I'm taking away the title that they thought they were going to have it was an admin error so that to me tells me, well, they were called and told they were selected. They made themselves present. They arrived. They were there. Like, you know, they're told they, had to, they were there. Every opportunity that was presented for them, they were there with all the best intention. They ticked every box that they could. And it was the admin errors which have turned that. And that's one of those things that we say is out of our control. And they're controllable. We can't control. So they can look back on that and think, well, I had to perform on these three things and I've got to tick on all of those. So it's out of my hands and I can know that that will probably stand them in very good stead for what they go on to do beyond this. Wow. Thanks both. So we're just going to pause for a bit of reflection. So athletes who are part of this workshop um, watching remotely, it may be that you want to press pause um, just to have a bit of consideration and time for yourselves and challenge yourselves with these questions to reflect on. So of all of these athlete identities, we've just been start discussing here. Do they hold the same value? So are there ones that you connect with most strongly? Um, how might each of those identities make you feel? So um, Alistair's done a really great job of articulating how he feels as an athlete and how he's controlled his controllables um, in the face of actually some real challenging scenarios that you've outlined, as fantastic examples. So how would each of us feel if you were in the shoes of any of those um, six, seven athletes there. And then which do you have the most or the strongest inkling that that means something to you? Who do you connect with most? Who means most to you? So if you want to have a consideration of those questions now, um, pause the video um, and then rejoin when you've had the opportunity to take some notes and, and have a bit of a think. 
Okay, so we're now going to move into the next section um, where we're going to um, be looking at um, what actually is an international athlete. And I'm really excited about this because I think Simon and Alistair might disagree with each other. So that's my, my kind of excitement. I encourage you both to disagree as much as possible because um, that will make, it will make for an interesting session for all the athletes joining us. But what is an international athlete? And, you know, let's, let's kind of consider, if you're with someone else watching um, this session, then jump into a paired conversation. If you're on your own, then, you know, either think it through in your head, grab a pen, jot, not jot it down, put some notes onto your phone. Um, but we're going to kind, kind of do this uh, paired discussion. So um, I, I put down four potential identities of a, an international athlete. Yeah, they're a competitor, but they're also potentially an ambassador, an influencer and an activist. So really, I guess, Simon, coming over to you, this concept of sports diplomacy where you're going as an athlete, you get to represent something. You could be an ambassador for something. You're even a, I guess when we described that Polish swimming team, they were, you, you started to do it, they were representing Poland. They were a diplomat almost representing Poland. What does that ambassador concept mean from your perspective for an international athlete? Thanks, Will. I, I think this is this is a really interesting question, and it's one that I think often athletes are not necessarily prepared for, not necessarily consider, and, and they have good reason because you're busy being, you know, elite and, and world class athletes. But I think as soon as you pull on a, a jersey or a vest or whatever your your kit may be, you have a badge on it, and it, it, it's a badge that says that you're representing something. Now. If you're representing Great Britain, Great Britain's a multifaceted thing. You know, it has many great qualities as a British citizen. I can say that, you know, our freedom to say that is even, you know, would be paramount for me. But it also, you know, there are things that are wrong in this country. There are things that go wrong. There are bits of it that I'm not very fond of myself. And there are bits of it that you may not be very fond of. But when you're pulling on that vest, you're representing all of it. You don't get to choose the bits that you like and the bits that you don't like. Equally on that vest, there may well be a, a manufacturer, a sponsor, um, a logo, um, the Youth Sport Trust, you know, a wonderful organisation, but you know, like any other, not without its occasional blips. So you've got to think about what you're representing is not just what you choose to represent, uh, but some of the other things that come with it. And some of those things one can easily push to one side and ignore. But some of those things might be you know, issues that you really care about. You know, the stance of the government on X or Y. And it's, it's not for me to, to say well, what's, what's right and wrong in that. But, you know, there are issues that individuals will care about, for example, with Tom Daly and LGBTQ plus rights. And that may be something that you have a, a view about. So you have a platform. In classical terms, in, in, in going back to you know, Cardinal Richelieu and the, the thinking of, of what a diplomat was, he was someone who went overseas to lie for their country. Um, you know, it, it's it's a job of representation. You're not you're not supposed to have, as it were, your own views. But equally, the people who are good at being an ambassador are able to take some of their own views in a little way and, and shape the presentation and the representation and the perception, as as Alistair said, of their issue, their country, their region, their ethnicity, their gender, and that just helps shape. The, the conversation and influence in and be a sort of advocate, if you like, for that. That's fabulous. Alistair, when you went to the Paralympics and represented GB back in 2012, were you, uh, we have, we've never had this conversation, we've met loads of times, but were you briefed on things you were and weren't expected or required to do or not do, I guess? Um, we, let's say, um, we're, we're made aware of um, some things, <laughs> of protocols and things like that. But I think when I look at this slide, it is great. We've got competitor, ambassador, influencer, activist. They all, I think, hinge around the word competitor, first of all. Now, yes, as a competitor, I'll be an ambassador. But what am I, what am I really representing? And it's always myself. Because when you just, or you go into the situation where you're representing your country, your nation, well, do you know what? I know there are some things that I don't like, there are some things that I do like and I love, but do you know what, this is what I offer my country. This is what I, and I say I'm a proud GB athlete, but I was actually born in Belgium, believe it or not. And um, 
but representing GB, like, you know, what am I doing every time I pull on the shirt? Well, do you know what? I'm giving GB the best of me, what I offer as a person. And when we go back to talk about those qualities that we were mentioning, that's all of those things. And that's what I'm giving you. And that's why we often say our oh, athletes work well as ambassadors, influencers and activists, because the perception of people is, well, hang on, if they're talking about that, well, I've seen how hard they fight for what they want in their field. Well, hang on, that is that is them. And maybe they're going to hang on to it and it's probably no better person, you know? Mm. And I, that links back to what the discussion was before about it's more than just a medal. However, when you look at how elite sport gets its funding in this ambassadorial kind of context, I'm going to ask Simon to talk about, a lot of it has been defined in, in a certain way. And I just... So I wanted to introduce this concept of, of soft power and, you know, briefly touch on why that's relevant in the world of sport and elite sport. Well, soft power is a, a piece of terminology that, that was coined by a, a Harvard professor by the name of, of Joe Nye. And it's essentially about the value of, of appeal um, being attractiveness, uh, attractiveness and why people would want to follow you, why people would want to uh, sort of ape you, ape your behaviours, ape your practices, whether as individuals, as, as sportsmen and women, as countries. And therefore soft power, you know, people put a great deal of into their branding, nation branding, um, how you can be attractive to others. And the United Kingdom scores very well in many of these measures. You know, people like the United Kingdom. We have sort of three great brands in some senses. We have the BBC, uh, the English Premier League and the, the royal family are things that are, are known the world over. Whether you like them or not yourself, they, they have a degree of attractiveness to people in other parts of the world. And they're, they're, they're just, they're icons, they're, they're symbols in many regards. But they're underpinned by a, a set of values, which again, you know, move and shift over time. But they provide a, a sense of what it means to be and what the perception to be British, to living this um, sceptre dial uh, and to create a, a perception that sport is important, um, particularly to the United Kingdom. And, you know, the, the sort of feel good factor, um, you know, described, um, you know, in the aftermath. First of all, in, in the aftermath of uh, England winning the 1966 World Cup and Harold Wilson's government suggesting that they've never had it so good. But after London 2012, it was it was tangible. Um, you know, as someone who was involved uh, with LOCOG, it really was something that was worked to. And that was not by accident. Um, Lord Sebastian Coe made legacy part of the bid um, that uh, London won uh, back in Singapore in 2005. So. It was a, a, a really, um, I mean, it's, it's difficult and that's why I'm sort of obfuscating a little in, in my language here, but it, it, it is something that is there and it's something that people notice, care about, try to assess, even if it is a little bit like squeezing a balloon as you, you identify it over here, it sort of expands over there. It's difficult to articulate, but it is there and it's something you notice when it's not there. If you compare the United Kingdom to countries with hard power, if you like, power to destroy things, power to take things away, then that is something that you can uh, see a, a sort of palpable uh, differentiation with. We probably see it at school games in the in the ceremonies and the, the opening ceremonies. Um, I know done differently this year because of management of COVID, but you know the easy thing for the person on the stage with the microphone is say, can I have a cheer for Scotland? And then the, the Scots will erupt and then you do a, can we have a cheer for Wales and the Welsh will erupt? And that's that's living out the kind of soft power and the pride kind of element, isn't it? And it kind of moves us into, Simon, this these concepts of representation, communication and negotiation, which are concepts about how as athletes we start to live out uh, the way we work. So what's really important what we're going to do for the the final part of the or the, the final chapter if you like of this session um today is think about um how we represent ourselves how we communicate what we are and how we come to an understanding of what we can and can't do and again alistair is doing a beautiful job all the time of articulating these things through live examples um see how these things kind of live them out and how they might be appropriate to your lives, everyone, as young athletes starting to make your way way through. And hopefully what we're trying to do is 
build a picture that this is normal. These are things to consider. They're not problems. They're good things to consider and take ownership of. And it's all in the context of what do I want my athlete experience to be? And hey, that's what this is all about. This education program is what do you want to be as an athlete and how do you want to experience it? So Simon, just moving us into what are representation, communication, negotiation in this context? Um, if you could give us a, a bit of an insight into how that can affect an athlete from their kind of activism and their personal brand, um, really, really bring these things to life. And then we're going to go into some live examples. Great. Well, to my mind, these are the three core concepts of, of diplomacy. So whether you call it diplomacy and whether you acknowledge it or not, if you're representing, communicating and negotiating, then effectively you're being, as it were, a small D diplomat, uh, an ambassador. So the representation of your nation, your region, your language, your gender, your sport, all of these are things that you have a, uh, a role in creating. Um, you can do it, as it were, importantly, or um, you know, you, it can be a second order effect. Communicating. You know, whatever identity you may have, communicating about it, um, again, consciously or subconsciously is, is important. So you're communicating about your nation. You're wearing a uniform, often of a, a national um, uh, context. The sport, you know, there's a great deal of kinship amongst, you know, swimmers, regardless of whether they're from in different parts of the United Kingdom or indeed the world. You know, and you might find you have more in common, to, uh, in common sorry, with, you know, a Belgian swimmer than you do with a fellow member of your um, national team who, you know, you have no interest in lacrosse, um, wonderful sport that it is. Um, but this is an example of where those different networks come into play. And it, it's those, the, the intersection of those different networks and the evolving nature of them that allows you to shape the different perceptions, to squeeze the balloon in different ways, if you like, between different parts of your uh, identity as a sports uh, man or woman. And you're negotiating. And again, that's not sitting down at a table with an agenda to say, right, uh, we've got five minutes on this and, and et cetera, et cetera. But it's, you know, you're constantly having to negotiate with different parts of the equation, you know, with the person sat next to you, with the IT facilities in front of you, with, you know, the, the training regime, this is where, you know, you're negotiating some of those things you can control. And as Alistair said, some of those things you can't, but you have to is effectively deal with it. And again, you know, these are just sort of conceptual terms, bits of language, if you like. But they're part of the, the reality of being uh, an athlete. They're part of the reality of being a diplomat. And that's where, you know, the concept of sports diplomacy, you know, intertwines. And we end up with this, uh, you know, sort of discussion. So two questions for Alistair then. And, and for everyone, everyone watching this, and I'm putting myself mentally, I'm putting myself into the shoes of the, the competitor I wish I'd been able to be. Do you see yourself, Alistair, representing, communicating and negotiating in terms of how you look back at your um, athletic career as a sportsman? Yeah, um, <laughs> there are various um, stages where you do all of those things. And I think what's really um, key for me has always been the communication and then, because you can't negotiate without any communication. I think sometimes, certainly when we're looking at this and probably dialing into this very conversation now, we're thinking of it as an, indiv as an individual, but that doesn't mean we have to go at it alone because what we, are, what we often find is when we align ourselves correctly, like, you know, we go further with others and it's putting yourselves in the right situation with like-minded people, like, you know, and come from a team sport, there was, um, had to neg negotiate with my teammates quite a lot because like you know not everybody wanted to do the same things but then we'd have to come to agreements for what was the best fit for us as a collective as opposed to an, an individual within that so that's think, a great example actually of the the dynamic of yeah. different sports as well oh no, totally and I, I think it's it's only once we get that understanding of what we truly want like you know wh where do we want to be how would we like to be viewed or perceived or, and even remembered you know and it's only once we're sort of comfortable with that then we sort of truly know where we'd want to be putting ourselves but yeah things whether it was the brand of shoes that we'd be wearing and why, why you're wearing a certain brand what does it offer to you and that word again understanding because this is actually something that happened around um, London where with one of my sponsors um, there was a particular shoe I was being given however 
the contracts that you signed with the games, you couldn't show you couldn't show any other brand other than Adidas at the time. And all my pictures had to be taken um, with the Adidas shoes. However, I was actually taken home a completely different shoe because they'd used the Paralympics and thing in the same phrase. So again, understanding like, you know, what we're doing is always key to negotiating best for ourselves. Did you ever consider yourself to be a diplomat? Is this your new career? Um, <laughs> I, you know, I'd, I'd never, i have never done that. How have we see um, how skill can be so transferable? Like, you know, and we don't, don't never, uh, we don't always notice it at the time. But yeah, do you know what? Um, what skills do I have? Yeah, I can communicate, I can speak, can articulate my thoughts and maybe that might be a good diplomat, especially if you're prepared to uh, perhaps fight for people that don't have a voice. Uh, if I may, I yeah. definitely... Um consider you a, a, a diplomat, uh, Alistair, you know, you're representing something by being here today, you've got a narrative to say, you're aware of the context in which you're speaking. Um, yeah, it, it, if, if it was in my powers, I would uh, uh, adorn you a, a diplomat. Oh, John, you, you made me go red, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is another one of those pause moments for everyone who's who's dialed into the into this workshop. So the age, the age that you are as an athlete, it is really, really important that you think about what you're, you're taking, not only into your sporting career, but into your whole life, okay? And the, there are skills that you are learning simply by being on this workshop, just by turning up, that are of value to you in terms of your next decisions that you make within your sport, within education, within your wider relationships, um, but also in terms of what career you may end up in. Representation, Communication and negotiation are all really important things. If you step into an educational institution, you enter a new team, you take a certain steps in your career. These are things for you to note down. So when you're representing something, what's important to you? How do you communicate about that? And then how do you negotiate your position within the confines of what might be expected of you? Please do take a moment again to consider these things before we move on to the next segment. Okay, so how do athletes use their soft power? I'm gonna whiz through some examples before we have another group conversation again. So uh, built on the matrix that we looked at before, that table we looked at before with communication, um, representation, negotiation. We're just gonna look at some examples. So here's a couple of examples of the use of soft power for your sport or in your sport. I always played a sport that is called a minority sport, i.e. not very many people do it. And I constantly talk to people about my sport because I'm constantly trying to get more people interested in it. Uh, it's not made much of a difference. Maybe my influence isn't so great or I need to work on those skills as part of my uh, professional development plan. But Adam Peaty absolutely led the way in fighting for a very different way for elite swimmers to be able to compete. And the International Swimming League uh, was formed and he was really outspoken about it. Initially, he risked a lot, you know, potential bans. But if you're one of the greatest swimmers of all time, you recognise the capital you've got and you think about what you can represent and negotiate. And he used his position to drive for change. On the right hand side, you may be less familiar, but Nigel Hayes of the Wisconsin Badgers uh, in the NCAA, the American Collegiate System in the basketball, he is someone who fought for his rights as an athlete in that system where millions of dollars are made for the institutions that these students play for, but there's a cap on how much of that benefit financially goes to the students. And so what he fought for was a change in the way that sport was experienced for those athletes. He sought to use his power as a leading young basketball player to do so. Equally, use your soft power for or about your nation. And um, obviously David Beckham's star value was critical in securing London 2012 at those presentations back in 2005, um, around the time when some of you were born, no doubt. But he was used, he was utilised, or he used and he utilised his brand, his reputation to negotiate a position for GB UK to be able to be the host of the Games. And in the Olympics just now in Tokyo, we got very used to that strange country called the Russian Olympic Committee which wasn't allowed to fly the Russian flag for various reasons. But you'll notice 
the tracksuit design was cunningly done so the Russian flag could be flown at those events. And that was obviously a very deliberate use of sport by that nation as a means to promote national pride, even when international sanctions were in place. You can use your, your power for a cause that really matters for you. Um, Marcus Rashford uh, has become possibly the most marketable member of the England football team, not because of what he did on the pitch. He got limited playing time during, Euro, during the Euros, but he is a national symbol based on the campaign he did to make sure the government would feed young people. Raheem Sterling embodies lots of the issues that came out from initially the Colin Kaepernick um, uh, taking a knee protest in the US. Uh, but now if you look at Kaepernick, you look at Sterling, there is strong representation of wanting to not give up in highlighting an issue um, that needs to be brought to the surface. And last on this screen right now, Hannah Mills, Team GB's best ever female sailor, is a phenomenal campaigner for reducing the amount of plastics that are used. She's using her sport for a cause that matters to her. And there's more of these examples. You know, you can go into Kevin Sinfield and the amazing effort he did running um, to raise money for the Motor Neurone Disease Association for his friend Rob Burrow, who was an inspirational player on the pitch. And Kevin, Kevin Sinsfield took that inspiration and took the power that he got from being a captain in his sport to influence others. And you've also got Raven, uh, Raven Saunders, you may have seen in the Olympic Games on the podium, did so almost keeping to all of the protocol, all those barriers that are put around you for when she made her protest to avoid the national anthems, those symbols of nationhood to fight and represent um, what she defined as, uh, defined as all the socially oppressed, you know, particularly those from minority ethnic groups, LGBTQ+, mental health. She wanted to use that platform to represent others because that mattered to her. Equally, and I'll stop ranting in a minute and pass over to Simon and Alistair, there's some great examples come out very recently about using your soft power, using that capital you've, been, you've built up and being confident for your own good. You know, Simone Biles is arguably not the best gymnast in the world ever, but one of the best sports people in the world ever, fundamentally, um, was only able, it seems, to take the stand she could because she was herself, because she was Simone Biles. And it was really important, I think, set a good example to everyone. Naomi Osaka took the step of saying she was not prepared to take part in those press conferences when um, that would damage her mental health and challenged it, and why not? Um, and even Christina, I'm going to get the surname wrong, and it isn't very good for me actually guessing it wrong, but Christina uh, Simuskaya, the Belarusian athlete, who used the only platform she could to drive for her own safety when she was expelled from the Olympic Village by officials for speaking out uh, in a pretty authoritarian regime in her country, uh, noting her off the back of her doing that, her husband had to flee from the country um, and, and get out um, uh, across the border into a different place. So there's a whole range of different ways that soft power can be used by athletes, but in different kind of ways. So I'm going to just jog us on to the next slide briefly and think about the different arenas where we can represent, communicate and negotiate and consider what's appropriate and consider where we are as athletes. So Alistair, of all of those examples I've just shared, what speaks loudest to you? You know, uh, I'll, I'll keep thinking about the bit where Simon and I are going to be disagreeing. You've got that in the back of my head now. When's it going? <laughs> well, um, for me, um, Naomi Osaka and Simone Biles, um, what's wrong with putting yourself first? Like, you know, because so often, like, you know, athletes, they give up so much and the perception can often be like athletes owe like everybody else everything, but at times, you do need to actually take care of yourself. And I think everything that you showed there is always so moving every time I see it from Raheem Sterling taking the knee. Now, what was really good about that particular picture was there was someone just further on in the background that was standing. There's, there's nothing wrong with that because you don't, we're not forcing anyone to take the knee. What is so good is that, well, had that player not been there, regardless, Sterling had enough conviction in what he believed in to take that knee. And, okay, what's everyone else going to think? Well, do you know what? If everyone takes the knee, sometimes I think, hang on, is it losing? It's like, you know, it's 
what's, what, is it losing its appeal, its voice? But well, wh why is there this difference? And it's only when we can understand the difference, we then decide what we think we should be doing. Because if everyone agrees on everything, I can often shut down so much, you know? Um, Simone Biles, again, like, you know, just a legend saying, do you know what, I'm not gonna do this because I'm actually at risk of damaging myself and my own hopes. Like, you know, and those are my um, teammates. Marcus Rashford, again, <laughs> we know what he had been campaigning about so long and look at the change that it's brought about. Like, you know, just from having that sort of profile that made everyone else ask questions. And going back to one of the first pictures that you showed um, with Tom Daly, what I actually think about Tom Daly and all of those athletes at the time, Eddie Deagle, had they not actually made the stand when they did, would they have ever gone on to be who they are? Because I think being able to do that gives you a sense of freedom. And it almost just, you can drop some of the baggage that you're carrying around and then you can focus on what's truly important. I often think, yeah, Tom Daly making that sort of um, stance back then actually allowed us to see the Tom Daly that he is today and the competitor that he always wanted to be. But could he have done that with always harnessing so much inside? Never really sure, you know? That's great. And there's great, again, examples there, Aster, of how, from an athlete's perspective, you're so easily able to say to us all, and this is really important, I need to be able to enjoy what I'm doing. 100%. I need to be able to be comfortable in what I'm doing and, and, and see it for what it is. Now, I, I perhaps unfairly set up Simon to disagree with you, so it might end up being me that disagrees because Simon's far too nice a chap. But I'm going back in my... I'm listening to everything you've just said, Alistair, and I, I agree with what you said. I remember the soft power slide where we said, why is elite sport funded? So that, that freedom... Simon, how does that freedom... This articul these athletes articulating what they want to is that what we're is that what we ex is that what's wanted through this investment into into sport wherever it comes from i mean that's a difficult one and it hasn't always been the case you could look back to which would be before many of you were born the the 1980 and 84 olympics the freedom of of uh, American athletes uh, and their allies in 1980 to compete was not there. Their government told them they could not compete in the Olympics. They had trained for four years uh, to be the best that they could be. And their government said, no, we're not sending you because we're representing something else. Likewise, in 1984, uh, in the Los Angeles Olympics, the uh, Soviet bloc didn't send its athletes. Um, you know, the controversy in this country that, um, you know, the British Olympic Association came under, particularly in 1980, not to send athletes to um, Moscow was huge. And what would that have done for, as an example, someone like Lord Sebastian Coe, who won his first gold medal in Moscow in the Luzhniki Stadium? Now, would he have gone on? He wouldn't have been able to then retain his Olympic gold medal in 1984. Maybe he wouldn't have gone on to, you know, do some of the other things that he did. Maybe he wouldn't have been such a prominent athlete uh, come or representative, uh, you know, to be a member of parliament. Maybe he wouldn't have, uh, as I first met him, been able to uh, open CNA, uh, a shop from way back when, uh, which was how I first uh, came across him in person, at least uh, before London uh, 2012. So, you know, these are all different facets. And, and, and Coe's a good example because, you know, he was you know, a very dedicated athlete who wasn't always the most popular, I think, amongst his, his peers, and certainly not in the sort of public perception of the great battles he had with uh, Steve Overt and, and, and Steve Cram, but went on to be, you know, uh, an administrator of a very successful, uh, at least perceived to be successful London 2012, a member of parliament, um, and now, you know, uh, head of the International Athletics um, Organization. So, you know, he's done a number of different things off the back of, as Alistair suggests, you know, sporting prowess. Now, he didn't necessarily take a knee or campaign in a public uh, sense whilst an athlete, but he's certainly taken on that sort of representative quality. And sometimes, it, you know, it will serve you very well in, in terms of endorsements or, you know, future success. But sometimes it can count against you. you know, Colin Kaepernick's career was ended by the starts he took uh, as a professional athlete. Now, some things are more important, to paraphrase um, our friends at Nike. Um, but these are 
you know, opportunities and a cause can be more important. Simone Biles, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, pu uh, putting herself first, the, the core mental well-being of athletes is not something that either international sporting federations, uh, national sporting federations, national governing bodies have necessarily thought about in the hundred plus years of organized sport uh, in the modern sense. Now, I'm delighted um, that they are being considered to a far greater extent in recent times. And, and, you know, the audience here will benefit from that, I'm sure. But it's, the, you know, there's a long history here that has seen, you know, athletes be expendable uh, as, as um, either, you know, representatives of sport or nations, and that has cost them, you know, the, the number of, as another example, Cuban boxers who've won Olympic gold medals, who've never fought professionally, you know, because that is not, uh, you know, in line with their government's um, way of operating. Now, there are some wonderful uh, boxers in that sense who, you know, keep coming back to the Olympics and amateur competition and do brilliantly, but they've never been able to fight in that different part of the, the sport that they, they're so good at. You know, whether they'd be a success or not, we never know. So there are consequences here. And I think they're, they're, you should be aware of those as you take on um, these different identities that we've spoken about. Simon, I, I've, got, I've got to come, come back at you there because um, Colin Kaepernick, what a great example. I know you said his career was nearly finished afterwards, which is brilliant. But then you remember the very first thing I said was we have to present as the man before the, before the athlete. And I think deep down in him, his career was almost secondary to actually who he wanted to present as. And he's someone that had opinions and a conviction behind what he truly believed now, claiming it was a, as a black male within a system that wasn't necessarily representing him. And whether he was the athlete or not, he would still live as that black man with, within a um, system that wasn't truly representing him. And I think what he did do was gave a voice to all of those that may never actually have that voice and he used his own um, position. I know there's a certain Lewis Hamilton doing similar things. And mm -hmm. going back when we talk about the ambassadorial roles and a great one that we saw at the Euros is Cristiano Ronaldo moving a bottle of Coke and then talking about water. Um, <laughs> I was very split on that. It would be great to hear what you think about that because when we talk about should he have done it, shouldn't he have done it? Well, what we have to remember is it wouldn't have taken any fans to buy a ticket actually for him to get any um, remuneration because of the sponsor Coke and because of everything that they put before him. So as much as I'll say, I don't think it was his place, but perhaps he actually, through his own actions there, he probably did a bigger job of um, promoting the brand than he would have realized at the time. So I, I think we have to be sometimes very clear in what we are actually trying to represent and like, you know, be an ambassador of. Absolutely. And so, cracking discussion and probably one that you two can have uh, later uh, and go on and hopefully our our athletes at the games can really start to consider with each other now i think what's really important is this session what we've tried to do is help you understand the opportunity that being your athlete gives you um, to start to think about how you represent yourself essentially so that you can grow and develop as an athlete and take advantage of the opportunities that are there for you, but feel that that is part of who you are, but isn't what you are, that it's something that you can actually have some agency over, so some control over. You can be yourself uh, and feel really comfortable um, in doing so and start to explore it. So where might you explore it? Well, you might start to explore your identity within the training environment. You know, what do I represent? What do I communicate to others through how I train or e equally in the competition arena? How are you representing your sport or your nation and the athletes village here at this event right now? How do you communicate with your coaching and support team? What's important to you? What should they be interested in? How can they help you along your journey? What about with your friends outside of this sport bubble? What, what's your identity to them? How do you represent yourself on social media and even... Well, how do you represent yourself within your club? How much of a voice do young athletes have within the club that you train as part of? And is that something that, that you want to think about uh, and potentially might have some influence over? So we pause for three conversations of consideration. I'm really hoping that you took part in those and either had a great conversation with some of your friends off your team 
um, whoever's next to you, if you're watching collectively, or took some notes on your phone or on a piece of paper. But there should be some real clear takeaways for you all. And just to summarize what they are, first of all, as an athlete, you are an ambassador. Like it or not, Alistair is now part of the diplomatic corps and he's going to be an ambassador for GB for now on. Ambassadors represent, communicate and negotiate. And we've, if we're agreeing that athletes are ambassadors, then we agree that these are things athletes do. But athletes are ambassadors for themselves, for their sport, for their nation, for their sponsors, for their cause, for their family, for whatever it might be. These are the things that you are representing communication, communicating, negotiating when you're on that field of play and beyond. And then finally, if we agree with all of those things, let's have a think, a real consideration of what kind of ambassador you are and why. What does this mean to you uh, and what you need to do and how might you set about doing those things? So what's important to you in the context of what we've been chatting about together for the last hour or so? We're going to leave you with... This quote, a lovely quote from Simone Biles, which I think sums up what we've been talking about today. So making sure that you always have fun and that you make sure it's your decision. If it's not your decision, you're not having fun. And if you're not having fun, you might not enjoy it. But if you're having fun, that's where the best memories are built. And for you as an athlete, this is a real experience. Alice is able to reflect on his real experiences and benefit for the rest of his life from how those experiences have landed with him. And that's what this session's all about. Trying to work out what the power is of being an athlete for you and for your peers and how you use that power. Simon, Alistair, thank you so much. Thank Everyone, you. enjoy the rest of the games and we'll see you soon around the Athletes Village.